Chickens are amusing and slightly strange birds. They act in many unexpected ways that might perplex a person. One of them is their propensity to dig holes at any opportunity. Chickens will occasionally dig just because they're bored, and other times they go a little bit further. They bury themselves deep into the earth. Sounds weird, right? Well, actually it's a technique to undo any heat damage. It's a method of heat protection, because, well, they don't have parasols. To achieve this, dig a hole that's deep enough to reach the cold earth, get inside of it, and wait for your body to gradually cool down. Sounds logical, but does it actually work? Certainly it does. Although cooling off is not the only reason chickens dig themselves into the earth, in fact, not only do hens cover themselves with dirt, dust, or sand, other birds also do this, but this time they're essentially taking a bath. I mean, you have to find other alternatives if you dislike being wet. The dust that gets into the feathers of the birds absorbs extra oil, resulting in matted feathers. The feathers are then left clean when the oil-soaked dust is easily removed. Excellent aerodynamics, no lice, these are just a few benefits that come from having clean feathers. Additionally, earth, sand or dust can be used as a body scrub to remove dirt and dry skin. It's a win-win situation. However, not everyone agrees that seeing a bird play around in the dirt is a good thing. Why? Sometimes even seasoned ornithologists are unable to determine precisely what the bird is experiencing. Is it a bath of dust, or is the animal hurt and suffering, or was it attacked by someone? All of these convulsive motions may be very unsettling to observe. In general, if you find yourself in a situation like that, don't try to rescue the bird or dig it out of the earth. Perhaps the poor critter is simply just trying to relax and cool off. And the good thing is that you can't state that all birds avoid water without exception. Even though there are many different varieties of ducks and penguins that enjoy being in the water, and males of the Namaqua sand grouse from South Africa stand out because not only do they enter the water, but they also soak it up like sponges. Some of the driest locations on Earth are home to these sand grouses. Consider instead that your newly hatched chicks are thirsty. Why is water needed to be brought to them? If you're a bird and not even a pelican, how do you go about doing this? Your best option will be to use your feathers. But how? Here's how the Namaqua sand grouse does it. Namaqua sand grouses fly to a puddle, wade in the puddle up to the belly, and intermittently shake the body while rocking back and forth. This lasts for about 15 minutes. These birds can absorb and transport 0.85 ounces of fluids thanks to the unique feather structure, about two teaspoons to be exact. After that, all that is needed to do is to give the chicks water. Sincerely, it is the most peculiar method of water collection I've ever observed in an animal. Even the claim that spiders ingest the water that condenses from damp air onto their webs is not all that shocking. This appears to make sense. These tiny drips on fine silk threads must have caught everyone's attention at least once, if not directly, then through photographs. This water had to be used by spiders. Why throw away nice things? By the way, humans have already discovered that constructions modeled after a spider web may help them gather water. It's a building known as Orca Tower. It's energy-free and gathers drinking water straight from the air on a daily basis, specifically from rain, fog, and dew. It's effective, but no matter what we do, the wild creatures are still more fascinating than people. Let's talk about the saltwater crocodile. During a drought, when they're separated from water, they attempt to flee by burrowing into the earth, much like chickens do. However, instead of just sand and dust, the saltwater crocodile looks for mud, considering that it's moist and prevents dehydration and sunburn. However, like the adage of going from frying pan to fire, the mud doesn't just serve as a shelter and cooling off place for the saltwater crocodile. Most times, it's their burial ground. Sounds shocking, but when the crocodile burrows into the mud, the mud gradually becomes dry, and the crocodile gets stuck, overheats, and eventually perishes. A saltwater crocodile can pass away in a few days from exposure to direct sunshine. In reality, it's a horrible way to pass away. But why do animals seek refuge in the mud from the heat? I get it when crocodiles act in this manner during a drought, but they are not the only ones. Pigs are a good example. They most certainly aren't linked to crocs in any way, but they sure adore mud. Scientists have also puzzled why pigs enjoy mud so much and have discovered that the explanation is due to their sweat glands, or rather the absence of them, including more fat layers and a physique that resembles a barrel with legs. A pig's body temperature drops by roughly 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit as it wallows in the mud. 
By the way, wallowing would still be more effective even if nature had given pigs adequate sweat glands because the moisture from the mud evaporates more slowly than cool water, which makes a mud bath consequently more cooling than cold water. This indicates that the impact lasts longer. Other creatures are aware of this, but it's a good thing that humans only produce sweat since many of the methods animals call themselves are, shall we say, not ideal for us. But marabou storks don't have the time for any of that. They just defecate on their legs. Problem solved. Yes, you heard it right. The moisture in waste products evaporates to cool the skin. That is, feces has certain benefits in addition to functioning just like our sweat. The marabou storks' droppings make their legs lighter in color and less heat sensitive. By the way, since we're talking about the cooling properties of bird droppings, I have some exciting news to share with you. Bird droppings could prevent global warming. Yes, researchers have discovered that the chemical makeup of the Arctic atmosphere is impacted by ammonia, which is present in seabird feces. More feces equals more ammonia. Clouds grow as ammonia levels rise, and more clouds means more coolness of the Earth's temperature. It might be time to discuss some other creatures now. Cicadas actually help each other cool off through showering. You are correct, I mean pea showers. Cicadas drink more liquid from tree leaves on the hot days, which causes them to aggressively urinate later and cool down. Remember the other day you were under a tree and it was hot, and you noticed some liquid-like water dropping on your head? Well, you know what I mean, so let's leave it at that. By the way, Saharan silver ants, unlike cicadas, are respectable and don't spray anybody, but they can still tolerate extreme heat. They actually explore the desert, gathering the remains of insects that perished in the heat. Due to their hair, Saharan silver ants can withstand the heat. In all seriousness, ants do have hair. Look at that odd silver hue. They are tiny hairs, and they serve to reflect light and keep the ants cool. It almost resembles a fridge suit. Oh, you think a refrigerator suit is excessive? How about air-conditioned apparel? It does, in fact, exist, and the first functional models debuted in the 1990s. Of course, Japan is where they originated. The Kuchifuku firm produces clothing with built-in air cooling, and it looks like someone stitched a pair of extra computer coolers into your jacket or pants. According to Amazon, these goods are still available for roughly $50. However, despite spending a lot of time discussing animal cooling mechanisms today, hippos haven't been addressed. Hippopotamuses sweating blood. If you were also anticipating this issue to come up, let us know in the comments. A sweating hippo looks like something that just stepped out of a horror movie. So it's not the best idea to go hippo hunting in the wild. It isn't going to end well for you, I suppose. The animal is covered in a red liquid, yet it's not typical perspiration. The purpose of perspiration is to cool the skin via evaporating. However, the liquid that comes out of hippos both hydrates and serves as a sunblock. Hippos have extremely fragile skin that's sensitive to burns, as I've mentioned in earlier videos on this channel. The secretions started off being white, but eventually turn red. This, according to experts, improves sun protection. This crimson sweat also functions as an antibiotic. Simply said, just pros, but not for Egyptians in antiquity. Hippos are thought to intentionally harm themselves when they become overweight or become unwell, according to some form of myth. According to legend, when the blood was expelled, the animals improved in health. I have no idea why the doctors in ancient Egypt adopted this method for treating their patients. I mean, not hippos, but people. Following that, this completely pointless bloodletting practice spread to other nations and continued in Western traditional medicine until the 1800s. According to the ancient ballad, the famous Robin Hood perished as a result of this behavior. Think about it. Bleeding Robin Hood to death while trying to save his life because you're emulating the practice of the bleeding hippos that are actually not bleeding in the first place? Sounds confusing, doesn't it? Okay, good. Very well. Let's move on. Tiny flies blew bubbles to cool down while cooling hippos confounded the ancient Egyptians. They create a bubble by blowing out stomach acids via their lips. The fly then pulls it back in after it cools down. The fly's head, thorax, and abdomen are cooled by doing this, something that may seem a little absurd. And the cooling effect will get stronger if the fly repeats the procedure a few more times. I'm curious if this will cause flies to freeze. But that's not the strangest of the cooling methods you'll find in the animal kingdom. The fish that comes out of the water to cool off wins the prize for the animal that cools off in the most absurd manner. The mangrove rivulus is cooled by air, unlike any other species that tries to dip its body into the water to cool itself. The fish jumps onto the shore when the water in its native tropics or subtropics reaches 96 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The air and water are roughly the same temperatures, but for some reason this fish is able to cool off in a matter of seconds after coming out of the water. Then it returns to the water after cooling off. Scientists are still unsure of its mechanism, so please share any thoughts you may have in the comments. See you later.